second part is about the question of terminology. Here there were many questions that tackled similar problems with different examples. And the big problem here is what one call, calls homonymy, which means that one word refers to different concepts. An everyday language example is the word row, R-O-W. On the one hand, row is a verb and it uh, means just to row a boat. One meaning. A second meaning is a row can also um, mean that there's a fight. For example, in the, in the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, we saw the anti-Semitism row um, in the last couple of months or in the last year. So this is another meaning of row. Third, a row also means a line of things uh, lined up. So you have the same word, you spell it the same way, you pronounce it the same way, but it um, denotes different things. And the same is unfortunately also true in many scholarly disciplines and um, discourses. One example for this is realism. On the one hand, there is realism as a school in international relations theory. And the term realism here comes from, um, a, or is a self-given name that those theorists who like this kind of theory gave themselves. And the thinking behind it was, we are the people that see the world as it really is, and that's, that's why we are realists. And the others, they are just like idealists who have some lofty ideas about how the world should be if it were a good world, but the world is not a good world, and that's why we are realists and they are idealists. And this was originally a claim they, ma they made, and many of them still make it. And this gave this school of thinking its name. And this is why I have mockingly always called them Realism TM. You also had this on my slides, because I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not, that this is not a description of what they are, but that this is um, a name that they gave themselves. And this is some claim that they make that I don't really um, support. However, there are also other meanings of the term realism. For example, what I also mentioned in the lecture was realism as an epistemological approach where you say, well, I think that there is a world outside human knowledge, outside human descriptions, and there is this reality, and that if humans know something, there is actually a connection between this outside world and the way we describe it. And this is epistemological realism. But it doesn't stop here. You can also say, well, there is, um, is um, realism as a movement in uh, the arts or a school in the arts, which is typically um, a kind of thinking where I say, well, art should depict the world. So maybe painters that want to um, paint pictures of the world that looks, look like the world really looks, and so on and so on. And then you can go further and then there are endless um, endless things that uh, are called realism. Here you cannot read this and you're not supposed to be able to read this. This is just a screenshot from the disambiguation page for realism on Wikipedia. And the, the lesson we learned here is there are a lot of ways you can define realism. All of these make sense. And this of course is a problem and it's kind of confusing and it might be easier to learn this stuff if people should, should just agree on one meaning for one word, but that's not the way language works and that's not the way um, all these things work, unfortunately. And something similar can be said about constructivism, con constructivism as an epistemological approach, where it's once again something, or it's the counterposition to realism, if you will, where they say, well, all human knowledge is first of all a construction that human beings make. And then some constructivists say, well, they make this construction in relation to something that happened out there, they're happening out there. Or if you are more radical, you say, well, no, this is just like a closed system and it doesn't really have any actual reference to something um, out there. 
And this kind of constructivism, you could also argue this in areas that have nothing to do with society. For example, you can also apply this to um, astrophysics or astronomy, um, where you can say, well, the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets, they don't care what we uh, write about them or talk about them. They are just there. And what we write about them won't change them in any kind of way. But still you can say, well, there's construction taking place. If you think of distinctions, for example, I just said, okay, there are the planets, there's the sun, there's the moon, and there are the stars. And now you might argue as some kind of realist that, well, they are there and we describe them as they are. And there's this big shiny ball, which is the sun. There's this somewhat smaller, less shiny ball, which is the moon. Then there are those shiny spots that are the stars. And then if you have a telescope, you can tell that some of them are even planets. And that's just like the way things are. And we describe them as they really are. If you are a constructivist, you can argue you make distinctions there that you consciously make and that depend on what you think about them. And this is, you can argue this for the distinction between the sun and the stars, because uh, physically the sun is just one star among many and it doesn't mean more or less than any of these other stars. However, for humans it does mean a lot more because it makes our life livable and so it kind of makes sense for human, humans in everyday discourse to distinguish the sun from the stars, but physically it doesn't make much sense. So however you distinguish them, it's some kind of human construction you can argue there. However, there's also social constructivism, which is a social theory. And there it's not just about description of things that exist um, maybe independent from these descriptions, but it's rather about things actually changing and emerging through these descriptions. One can make this case about um, the economy and um, uh, O'Brien and Williams uh, mentioned that constructivists argue that um, the ideology of the market also shapes the market, but maybe it's simpler to see this when it comes to race. Until the 18th or 19th century, there were, of course, human beings who looked differently in many ways, but there were no, no races of human beings. And biology, 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 biologically, right now, there aren't any races either. But in the 18th and 19th century, some Europeans came up with a concept of race, saying, well, these, these human beings are race A, these are race B, these are race C, and they are somewhat differently. And this was all mostly made up stuff. Yet this was made up stuff that had strong effects because those human beings that were ascribed to a certain race, they had different chances in life than those that were um, assigned to another race and so on. And this had very strong effects on the livelihood of people and it really changed social relations and still has effects right here. So there's also a construction of difference, but in a very different sense than a construction of difference between stars and sun, which is just a description of something that might happen or might exist independently. And in social constructivism, the claim is even stronger, saying, well, what we construct there, this is actual reality, and by describing things, we are creating things because there was no race before. And there is a lot that could be said right, said right here, but the main point is once again that the same name, the same word means quite different things, which makes things more complicated, but we have to accept this and not meddle these things up. And one last short point, some of you asked also similar things about those three schools of thinking that were called methods in the textbook and that I say cut across the question of method and theory um, and, and other um, categories. And once again, one could say it is a method or one could say it's way more than method. It depends also on the question what you define as method. One more thing I 
say that might add to confusion, but might also help understanding this, what these are, these um, three um, pink lines there. These are like schools of thinking and how to do scholarship, because there are endless ways how you could do IPE or any other kind of academic discipline, but any scholar will have to decide for one certain ki kind of doing scholarship. And in order to do this well, they have to associate with other scholars. So one professor at one university, she has some friends at other universities who think similar than she does, and maybe she then has students who then become professors at yet another university, so they form some network of scholars, and then say, they say, well, we're constructivists, and this means we believe in this theory, we do this method, and this, and so on, and only if you have these kind of networks you can actually do science. And this kind of cuts across, and I don't know if this answered any question, but I said it anyway. So, now we come to the third part. Many of you ask questions about those three approaches, and many of you also mentioned the three diagrams or illustrations that O'Brien and Williams used to describe those paradigms. And I think th those diagrams work explaining it if you explain those approaches a little bit more. First is, they say, economic nationalism can be illustrated as some marbles crashing. And what do we know about marbles? Marbles are all kind of like, they are all round, hard things, and there's not much more to them than being round and hard and alike. So, we don't really know what's inside these marbles and we don't really care. They're just round hard things with a round hard surface. And what do we, else do we know about marbles? When they hit one another, they don't change much. Maybe one of them has a small dent or so, they might change the way they were moving when they hit one another, but they don't interact, they don't merge or anything, so marbles be marbles. And how does this explain um, economic nationalism? It first of all means that economic nationalists believe that all states are to some extent alike in striving for more power and for more wealth. And it doesn't matter whether those states are more or less democratic or liberal, they are all just marbles striving um, for more power and wealth and they are encountering internationally as these marbles and we don't have to look into them, we don't care really what um, happens inside of them. And this is often used to illustrate um, realism in international relations theory, but it also um, kind of makes sense here because as a nationalist you would say, well, all nations have the same general characteristics and most of all nations are the only players out there and all those human beings and companies and classes and whatever are in these marvels, we don't really have to know anything about this to describe the ways in which um, those marbles act and interact. In the second picture you have this um, spider web or cobweb and this represents that the idea that there are connections between different nodal points in this net and if all those connections exist and you just like have these points there and let them do what they do then something systematic will somehow evolve out of it. So there's no central points, there are no big players crashing all the time, it's just like some some structure that will evolve where a lot of different actors are at different points and you see that in this uh, cobweb they have stars in some point, they have squares, they have circles, so this probably represents the fact that they are businesses, they are states, they are individuals and all other kinds of organizations that are in this web and it's none of them determining anything, it's they all form the web and they all benefit from it and if you just like let all these tiny things happen and let them be what they are then something beautiful like a spider web will emerge and I hope you are not um, arachnophobic and can appreciate the beauty of spider nets 
Um, otherwise, liberalism might not be for you. Finally, why do critical theorists believe that um, the international political economy is a layer cake? The layers in the cake here probably represent um, the classes. So if you have a layer cake, cake and you cut across it, all pieces that you have will also be um, um, uh, layered in the same way. And similarly, critical theorists argue that all countries are um, have societies that are uh, marked by a uh, class distinction. You could, in a very blunt fashion, argue this way. Let's say we have four people. We have um, a CEO at the French automobile manufacturer PSA. We have a CEO at the Japanese auto automobile manufacturer um, Toyota. We have, at the same time, a, a simple manufacturing worker at um, Peugeot, which is part of PSA, and we have a manufacturing worker at um, Toyota. So if you are an economic nationalist, you would say, well, those, um, those French guys, they have in common that they are French, they are part of the same nation, and if Paris makes good politics, then all of them will benefit because the, the whole um, country will get more wealth and power, the whole company will be better, it will be better for employers and for managers. The same is true for Japan as well. If you are a Marxist, which is um, one of the strengths of critical theory in IPE, you would say, well, no, workers be workers, managers be managers, and they have more in common on each um, class level. And if we have a type of globalization that will help managers more than it will help workers, then it's the same in Japan and in France. So this is our central um, category of analysis. And then there are other strands in critical theory, like for example, world system theory, that argues that it's not only that in all countries we have the same class layering, but it's also that some countries are in a lower layer in the international political economy than other countries. For example, before I mentioned this, this um, problem between international investors that typically come from the global north and then invest some of their money in the global no south, this is not a, a symmetrical um, relation. So one can say that in the global class structure, uh, there is also some geographic distinction and that in the global class structure, um, northern countries are also further up than, than uh, many countries in the, countries in the um, global south. And one more thing about this question about class here. One of you asked, um, they said, okay, um, I see how states are actors, I see how individuals and firms are actors, but I don't really see how classes can be actors. And this is actually a very good question because when we think about actors, we think about some person or whatever that makes maybe conscious decisions on their actions and then act. And you can make this case for individuals, obviously. You can also make this case for states and for companies, although the decision-making processes are more complicated there, but they are there. But you can hardly make this case of being an actor about a class, which means it's just um, a class means that you think of some million of people that are not in any organized structure um, per se, that are just united by the fact that they are, I don't know, office clerks or, or um, production workers or managers or business owners or whatever. And of course, they do not uh, collectively make any decisions on how they act. So it would probably be more right to refer to class as a central category of analysis than um, as the central actor because classes don't act um, in the same way, but yet they are um, very important to um, economics and to um, IPE in particular. That being said, you can also make the opposite case and say, well, there are labor unions that sort of speak uh, for a certain class interest, there are business organizations that sort of do this, and you can argue this case, but it will not be the same as a state being an actor or 
um, a business being an actor. Now we come to the full, fourth bigger part of the Q&A session where I have to make some sort of dis disclaimer about what I said about the second major transformation and the possible end of the era of globalization. I thought I was cautious enough in emphasizing that this is just some hypothetical maybe and there are certain signs of crisis and that this might mean that we are coming to some point of transformation. But it seems I might not have been cautious enough because many of you were really curious about this, I think rightly so, but um, you took me more serious than you should, uh, should take me um, because this is really only some idea that one might have. And I would just like use this and not, no, it's, it's not an idea that I just have, it's an idea that is out there and it's not my idea um, to be sure. Um, and I just want to say some general points about predictions. First, many of you will know the joke that predictions are always difficult, especially about the future. And I kind of explained this when mentioning the models um, before. So even if you have very good theories of how economics work and what kind of um, what kind of change in one situation will lead to other changes later, you never really can know for to 100% how these relations will work and there are always so many unknown variables that you can never really predict um, the future, particularly not in social sciences. In astronomy, most of that is pretty simple. You can be quite sure that the Earth will still circle around the Sun once a year over the next couple of years and it may slow down a little bit but you can easily, easily or you can calculate it if you are an um, astrophysicist. With society it's much more um, um, complicated than this to predict the future. And this also means that we as uh, social scientists have to be disciplined here. There is another saying saying that every chemist always have, has to fight the um, alchemist in themselves. Which refers to the fact that chemistry is sort of originating in, in alchemy, but alchemy is a little bit like a magic practice of um, the Middle Ages where people try to create gold. And chemistry is a science that might be very boring at some points. And so chemists have to um, stop trying to just like find the secret formula for gold. And similar, it has been said that social sciences are not social prophecies and all social scientists have to fight the urge within themselves to try to be social prophets. And I also have to fight that urge in, in, in myself because of course it's very attractive to be the guy that predicts what will happen in 10 years and there are many people who build their careers on some of these predictions and maybe they guess right but it's typically not good social sciences to, um, uh, to predict any big major development that will happen because you really cannot know that. We can probably know that Donald Trump will not win um, uh, in the state of California and the state of New York in November 2020. That's pretty sure, but the bigger the developments are that we want to predict, the more uncertain we are right there. And this also has something to do with the fact that while the movement of the stars and the planets, they only depend on, on laws of physics that we mostly know, and those of the laws we do not yet know, we could know at least. In society and politics, I would argue it's not the case that, that the future depends on laws of um, nature that we could know in theory, because it always knows it always depends on the actions of human beings and these actions could always be different. Human beings can always decide to do something else. And if you have a great number of human beings, you can make some prediction of probability, what will or will not happen. But the more it depends also on, on individual events or on individual decisions, the more uncertain your um, decisions um, or your predictions um, B. 
become. And this also relates to um, two questions you ask more concretely. Someone asked, how come that after the end of the golden age of capitalism, another form of capitalism rises, if you could name globalization a form of capitalism? First, I would absolutely say that the globalization that we witnessed over the last 50 years is a form of capitalism. And then you ask, okay, how come capitalism was in big crisis, and then after that we still had capitalism? Why so? And the simplest, simplistic answer to this is because those who wanted more capitalism won. There are always different groups of people that want different kinds of future, and then what future will happen is, at least in part, a political decision. So if those who want a certain future win, then they will get at least some version of the future they wanted and the losers will have to um, live with it. Um, we can also say something similar about um, the immediate future. Someone um, asked about something that I also mentioned as a possibility in the lecture. Um, the person asked, could the high unemployment rate and the suiting rise of homelessness and poverty in the US lead to a better welfare state in the US of, of the future? could of course ask when a welfare state is good or better, but let's not go this down this road right now, I probably understand. You in meaning a better welfare state, meaning a more active uh, welfare state, giving more security to more people. And um, I think this is a possibility, because I think right now many lacks of the American welfare state are becoming more visible than they were ever before. For example, one major problem in this pandemic is um, is um, paid sick leave. In Germany and many European countries, actually in most industrial countries in the world, if you are sick and the doctor testifies that you are sick, you can just send a letter to your employer and then you can stay at home for the week and um, still get your pay. In the United States, this is at least not federal law. Some employees have this privilege, but it's not a general right you would have. And what does this mean in, in a pandemic? If you have a bad cough and a fever, it would be very good for you and for everyone if you stayed at home, because then you wouldn't infect any others. And if you have paid sick leave, you can somehow get this um, letter from the doctor and then you can stay at home. If you don't have this, and you need the money you work for, and typically you do need the money you work for, then you have to go to work anyways, and then you probably infect more people. And this is obviously bad in a situation of a pandemic. Also, it's always bad, but now it's even worse and it becomes visible how bad it is. And there are also some other aspects um, there and there. It might be that many people see, well, we should really have paid sick leave. And while they're at it, they could also say, well, we also want paid maternity leave and we also want universal health insurance and all of these claims were out there all the time. But will this happen? It's a question of politics, not of logic or of, of political science. It's a question of politics and it depends on who will win the presidential election. It will depend on who will win uh, a majority in, in both houses of Congress. And then whether it will work out or not. So this is a question concerning politics and I would say it's very well positive. It's probably desirable, but it's not certain because the future is always unwritten in politics.